Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our final session today. So I'm Anna Nordstrom, and I work in the Markets Group at the New York Fed. And I'm pleased to host this final session today with some interesting uh, papers on central bank balance sheet and operations. So uh, we have two very interesting papers and interesting presenters and discussants. So the first paper offers an estimation of the level of reserve balances needed to, uh, for the Fed to maintain an ample supply of reserves, including when large economic shocks can significantly change the demand for reserves. In estimating reserve demand, the, papers the paper considers in a quantitative model new aspects of bank level heterogeneity in the Fed funds market and also incorporates the array of Fed's policy instruments, such as the administered policy rates. The paper also offers diagnostic tools to gauge the central bank's ability to track a given Fed funds target and the heterogeneous incidence of policy actions on the shadow cost of funding across banks. Ricardo Lagos will present this paper today. Ricardo is an associate professor of economics at New York University. As discussant for the... So, you're full professor, I have it incorrectly here. I will correct that, apologies. <laughs> Let's see how many more mistakes. Oh. As discussant for this paper, we have with us um, Pierre Colin de Fresne from Ecole Polytechnique, Polytechnique Federal de La Lausanne, and he's joining us um, online here. So, hello, Pierre. And the second paper analyzes the liquidity transformation of banks in the euro system. As you know, the broad collateral framework of the ECB is comprised of high quality liquid assets, so-called HQLA, as well as non-HQLA. And the paper estimates how much liquidity transformation is generated by non-HQLA via usage of the ECB operations. The paper also examines the extent of the intentional liquidity transformation arising from ban banks pledging less liquid assets first as compared to coincident liquidity transformation. And we have with us here Ben Harton, and, and he will present this paper. And Ben is an economist here at the ECB in the Market Operation Analysis Division. And to discuss this paper, we have Quentin van der Weyer from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business. So thank you for all. So with that, please, Ricardo, you can take the stage. Okay, this is a joint work with Gaston Navarro, who's at the uh, Federal Reserve Board, so the usual disclaimer, nothing that I say or that we write reflects any of the views of the Fed. Um, that might become obvious pretty quickly. So, um, so, so these, are the two, um, these are the two textbook operating frameworks that a central bank can use to implement a particular interest rate target. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the Fed funds rate in particular. So there's a corridor system, this is the one that was in place in the U.S. before the great financial crisis, um, you know, characterized by scarce reserves. Uh, and then in that model, you know, that's kind of the demand for reserves. You have quantity reserves on the horizontal, Fed funds rate, equilibrium Fed funds rate in the vertical. So you're operating on the steep part of the demand. And the way you manage the R star, which is the interest rate you want to implement, is by open market operations, changes in Q. Okay? Um, since the great financial crisis, we're in an abundant reserve world. So now you know, we're running a floor system where um, you know, you're operating on the very flat part and the way you manage the rate is no longer open market operations. They will need to be too big to get any traction. So you manage administered rates. The US has three administered rates at the time, discount window rate, interest on reserves, and the ONRRP, the overnight reverse repo facility, okay? Um, okay, now, Comparison of these two, you, you read material saying, you know, this one's kind of demanding because you have to be managing the liquidity of the market on a daily basis. Uh, so it requires a lot of information about, you know, the slope of the demand. Uh, and that's the way the world works before 2007. This one, sometimes you read it's preferable because you don't have to manage actively the demands. You're kind of associating the market with demands. And, uh, and then it's, you know, the informational requirement on knowing stuff about the demand look less onerous, it's flat, you don't need to know the slope. But here you need a lot of local information on the demand, which arguably, you know, the Fed funds traders and the New York Fed, whose job was to actually hit the Fed, Fed funds rate target before the crisis, they had a lot of knowledge on how to, on what that slope was. Now, 
you don't need a lot of local information, but you need global information because you need to know whether you're on the flat part or not. And that's, I'm going to argue, it's more onerous than the other one. So our job in this paper is going to be trying to tell you what the shape of the demand looks like, the global shape, not just a local slope. Okay? And the reason is, so in, in Darrell's language, he called it the minimum ample quantity of reserves. We call it Q prime in this picture. You'd like to be on the flat part. You know, let's take away the, the ambiguity of what, how flat is flat for you. We have to give you a quantity. Is it three trillions enough, four, one? Okay, so this paper, one of the things we'll do is we'll give you an estimate of that Q prime, okay? Um, okay. So, it seems easy, right? Just go estimate the thing. So this is the data. This is what it looks like. Um, on the horizontal axis, you have the quantity of reserves outstanding in the US in billions of dollars. On the vertical, you have the effective Fed funds rate, you know, the market traded uh, overnight uncollateralized loan between banks. And we're netting out the IOR, okay? That's a brute way to sort of adjust for policy changes in the IOR. This is a space where you wanna find the demand for reserves. There you have the raw data. Okay, so uh, what do you do? I mean, you know, it's tempting. You kind of guess a downward sloping thing there, maybe fit a line. But then you start thinking one line, you know, because this is data from 2010 to 2019. Before 2015, the Dodd-Frank liquidity regulation wasn't phased in. The LCR, for example, is phased in between January 2015 and 2017. And then, you know, after January 2018, that's when SLR compliance comes in. So maybe you need two lines. But then there's other things. The administered rates over the whole sample have changed. Sometimes the spreads, so I'm gonna call them IOR, sorry, discount window rate, IOR, ONRRP. There's like a ceiling, there's a basement, there's a floor. The spreads between these rates have changed. So maybe, maybe you need more demand curves because those cost shifts, who knows, okay? So in the last three editions of this conference, you've had two papers that try to do exactly this. They do raw econometrics with very little or no theory to try to estimate the demand for reserves. You saw one in 2021 and you saw one last year. I'm gonna talk about them later. Uh, so we're gonna take a different approach, meaning we're not gonna go reduce form a theoretical econometrics, we're gonna bring some theory to bear. Okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use a quantitative theory to deliver a structural estimate of the aggregate demand for reserves in the US. Okay? We're gonna discipline this theory by making sure that it's consistent with a wide array of cross-sectional moments of the distributions of reserves, the distribution of trading activity, and the distribution of interest rates traded between banks in the Fed funds market, okay? So it'll be our discipline. We do that to make sure that you know, the model we put up, it's a reasonable model of interest rate formation in the Fed funds market. So after those validations, we're gonna use basically our model as a lab you know, we're gonna fit it to local information on demand, say in 2019, and then we're gonna use the power of the theory to extrapolate. See, when you do econometrics, you only have data for very large levels of reserves. So whatever functional form you're fitting, that's your extrapolation. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna discipline the extrapolation with the structure of the theory. That's again, it's discipline to fit a bunch of cross-sectional moments that I'll describe in a minute. So two questions to be specific. The first is, what does the reserve demand look like for lower quantities? You know, we haven't visited, since Dodd-Frank, we haven't visited quantities of reserves, you know, below a trillion. So, you know, maybe the, if it's shifted structurally, we'd like to know what it looks like. Maybe you don't want to go there, but you need to know what it looks like to decide if you're going to be there or not, okay? And the second is just going to be a number. You know, Neil Wallace, that's, he was my advisor's advisor, he is. Um, he used to have uh, this famous saying that, there's no interesting question for which the answer is a number. And I think this is gonna be probably the only counter example I know to that. Uh, okay, so in the paper, this is just an ad for the paper in case somebody's inclined to read it. There's three reasons that you may want to open it. The first is we document a bunch of new micro and macro wide facts. So this market, you know, you talk to experts at the New York Fed or the board, that's where they live, these experts, and they, they have all this wisdom but it's, you want to read about it and it's hard, you know, it's all dispersed. So we are gonna collect a bunch of, you know, uh, facts about, you know, distribution of rates, who trades with whom, how fast they trade, stuff like that. That's gonna be relevant for our calibration of the theory. 
Then we're going to, a second reason to read it is we're going to extend what I call a prototypical structural model of the Fed funds market, which is some work that I've done with Gara Afonso uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, but when I, that model, as much as I like it, has no chance of hitting all the cross-sectional moments because it's too simple. It has homogeneous banks. You know, banks trade with the same frequency. They have the same market power. Uh, they have the same end-of-day payoffs. So we, now we're going to enrich that model so that it has a quantitative shot at, at uh, matching data. And the last thing we do is, like I said, when I estimate the demand, I'm going to develop a tool. You know, it's going to be a, a tool that will tell you, yeah, what this minimum ample quantity is. But we're going to give you a probabilistic answer to that. Okay? We'll give you a point estimate, and then we'll give you a probabilistic answer. So we were sent many emails saying, careful, because this is not a technical audience, so don't, don't overbear. So there's some notation here. You don't really need to pay attention. It never show up, shows up again, but it's just a placeholder to tell you what the model looks like. I think you have to understand, given we do a quantitative theoretical exercise. So we're going to model a trading day. There's going to be a large number of banks. Banks are going to be heterogeneous in a number of dimensions, so I'll describe in a minute. Okay? Um, in our empirical implementation, there'll be four types of banks would be enough to capture all the riches we want to capture. Now, in picture this. So you start the day, and a primitive of the model will be a beginning of day distribution of reserve balances across the banks, which we're going to estimate from data and feed it into the theory. Okay? Then another ingredient, that's that bullet there. Another ingredient is going to be these banks are going to have, it's a trading day. We're going to impute end of day payoffs. That will encode, you know, what happens to you if you end up with excess reserves? What happens to you if you end up with short of reserves? I'll, I'll give you a, exactly the functional form we feed in the theory in a minute. It's going to be a piecewise linear thing. If you're in excess, you get paid the IOR. If you're in deficit, you get you got to go to the window, and that's a higher interest rate. And then what happens? So you start. Let's say you start the day and you're short. You know, you're, you start with negative reserves. You know, the trading day, your trading desk wanted to make some deals and they left you negative. So you're going to have to make up before the end of the day. So how do you make up? You're going to be running into people, calling other banks up with some frequency, which is called beta here. And there's going to be banks that trade with other people faster than others. You can think of them as being more central in a network, having a bigger trading desk. They just get more activity per, per unit of time. And then once you contact the counterparty, how do you decide the interest rate, you decide the quantity of the loan and the interest rate on the loan? How do you do it? You bargain which, by the way, it's the way it works in the Fed funds market. Okay? So that's uh, what we do. Then also during the day, things happen. You have a plan. You, know, you meet, you're trading, but there's also payment shocks happening during the, during the day. Lambda is a frequency with, with which you get hit with a payment shock, and G is going to be conditional on you getting a payment shock. There's a size distribution of payment you have to send to somebody else. Think of that as being things beyond your control, like you know, checks or, or payments uh, on behalf of your clients, stuff like that. Okay? So that's, and then um, let me go back to this end-of-day payoff. So this, you know, when you read the rules of you know, what happens to your reserves end-of-day, how much you get remunerated, it's like a manual. I asked for it once. It's like 200 pages. This is a good summary. If your excess reserves are above zero, you get paid the IOR. Okay? So you get a, a linear bid which is relatively flat compared to this, which is what happens to you if you have to borrow in the, win the discount window. Okay? You can add the you know, discount window rate plus stigma, what, whatever. You can, you know, it's just going to be steep. The point is this is steeper than that. So now, this is your end of day payoff. So imagine doing the slope of these two things. You know, it's going to be a step function. You know, right? This slope is flat. That's very steep. So that's what the, the derivative of that looks like. This is the marginal value to you of a dollar if you happen to be negative at the end of the day. How much are you willing to pay? You're willing to pay up to the discount window rate. That's your maximum willing to pay for a dollar. What happens if you're in excess? Well, your marginal value is that what you get it from the IOR. So this is the minimum rate you're willing to accept for lending a dollar. So if, if two people met at the very end of the day without trading options left, the interest rate will be somewhere in between, depending on their market power. So let's say half-half, the interest rate will be in the middle. Okay? Now, but that's, that's fine. Now imagine you ask the bank, what's your marginal value? This is what they tell you of what's your marginal value reserves at the end of the day, when there's no more trading activity. Imagine you ask them at the beginning of the day, what's your marginal value? Now, for that, you need the theory. Because that, that beginning of the day value will encode all your expected trading opportunities. 
it will encode the risk of getting payment shocks, all that is in there. So that's what it looks like. First observation, it looks a lot like these pool demands that people assume in these uh, simple models, the pool 68. So first of all, it's kind of smoothed out because of the shocks and, and the shocks of who you meet and who you trade with. And the more important thing for us is notice the marginal value of a dollar, if you're in deficit, if you're negative, is now lower than the discount rate. Why? Because that's the option value of trading. You're willing to pay less at the beginning of the day because there is the chance that you run into, you're short. There is a chance you run into a guy who's very long, positive. And then you'll get a deal when you negotiate that's better than the discount window rate. You know, only if you have no trading opportunities will the guy push you to your discount window rate. Okay? And similarly, the marginal value of a dollar is bigger if you are in excess because you're not going to be stuck with that with the IOR. There's a chance you meet a desperate guy, sell it to them for something above. Okay? Now, this is for a typical bank being a day. And then the point is, during the day, this thing is shifting, and at the end of the day, it's going to look like the black when your uh, trading options are gone. Imagine now there's a fast bank. A fast bank is a bank that meets more potential trading partners per unit of time. This is what it looks for the fast bank. It's smoother, it's flatter. Why? Because the option value of trade is bigger. It's like the fast, guy, the fast bank has more time on the clock all the time. Okay? Now, what I'm going to show you later when I show you the, the aggregate demand implied by the model, it's nothing but, by the way, this is the marginal value of a dollar for banks. When they negotiate bilaterally, the interest rate will be a weighted average of each, per, you know, each bank's marginal value of a dollar. So the interest rate, when two banks trade, will basically be, you know, again, a weighted average of these marginal values. So these things that look like demand for reserves, they will be demand for reserves later on. So here's what we do. This gives you the interest rates in every bilateral trade. At any, at any point in time between any two banks. So we compute the economy, a bunch of banks trading with each other at different rates. Then we compute the weighted average of these rates, okay? And the weighted average of those rates will be nothing but a weighted average of these curves, okay? So when you see later the model-generated demands, they're just a convolution of these lines. I mean, what else are prices if not mar you know, marginal utilities of people? It's the same with the interest rate. They're marginal the value of a dollar. Now, when you aggregate this up, you know, the shape will depend on how many fast banks there are, how many payment shocks, and everything else. But for example, we're going to have an experiment where we have a network shock where we take off the market the four fastest banks, which are the usual. You know. Then what are you going to get? Well, then you will see that the aggregate demand for reserves will steepen because you're taking away the guys with the lower, with a flatter marginal value, which are the fast guys. So all those things kind of become, the model is convoluted, but I think the economics is pretty simple. So let me, um, there's a lot of evidence that we use to calibrate, but I'm going to stick to just the first one, okay? Which are measures of Fed funds activity. This is the way we sort banks into different types, okay? So this picture has, that's, that measure we call the participation rate of a bank. Take a bank, look at all the Fed funds they extended and they received in a day, and divide them by the total trade volume in the market, okay? So this statistic will tell you what's your individual share in a typical day of total trade in the Fed funds market. Look at this bank here, close to 20% on their own. On, a, on an average day in 2019, they accounted for about 20% of the volume on their own. So what we do is this. So this is a sense of who's fast and who's slow. In the model, if you trade very fast, you're going to show up here really to the right. Okay? You see what I'm doing? This is a cumulative distribution function of these participation rates is a measure of heterogeneity of trading activity for each bank. So we're going to split them in four groups based on this. We take the top four, and we call them fast. Then we take all the banks that account individually for 1% of the trading volume or more, but they're not the top four. We call them medium speed. And then everybody else we call slow, except for GSEs, government-sponsored enterprises, which have different end-of-day payoffs because they don't access the deposit facility with the IOR, they get the ONRP. So we treat them differently. So four types. Okay? Now, there's another statistic that's useful, this one up here, which we call the reallocation rate of a bank. So now, take an individual bank. Look at all the Fed funds you extended. Net out all the ones you received and divide by your gross daily trade. Okay? So this is a statistic that's between zero, between one and minus one. If it's zero, this is a bank that literally was a market maker. 
It traded a bunch, but the net position was zero. So it was just buying and selling. They were not trading on their own account effectively. If it's plus one, it's a bank that only lent. If it's minus one, it's a bank that only received in the day. So what we're doing here is we're showing these kind of network looking pictures where we have the participation rate, the one I showed you earlier on the vertical, and the relocation rate on the, on the bottom. So for example, GSEs, you see that they participate a fair amount, they're always lending, they're only lending. You look at fast banks, the core, you know, they're high there because we sorted them on participation. They're next to the middle, next to zero, meaning they're the market makers in this model, in this, sorry, in this model, in this market, this is the data, okay? And then, you know, you can compare across years. So, you know, stories, you hear these stories, GSEs mostly lend, they're lending a bunch to M banks, those are foreign banks. You know, this is a period where there was this, you know, institutional arbitrage that I'm not gonna get into, so you, can, it, you see it there. So it's a good way to understand the market, and that's, I wanna put an ad for that. Now, the rest of the, uh, the moments are all very interesting. We estimate uh, payment shocks for each bank type. You know, how frequently you send payment shocks to, to other banks and how big they are, because that's critical for calibrating our theory. We estimate the end-of-day distributions for the four types of banks. We make adjustments um, you know, by regulation D, by LCR. We net out predictable payments because those are irrelevant from the point of view of the theory. Um, and those are the things we feed in the model. Okay, I'll skip the calibration. There's a bunch of parameters that we, we've used to fit the data. Validation, basically the model looks really good in terms of uh, moments that we did not target. Uh, and that are relevant. So this is the place where you know, it, it gives us confidence that it's a reasonable theory of interest rate formation in the Fed funds market. Okay, so now, here's what we're gonna do. This is now the, the model generated uh, output, okay? Here's what we do, we take, we input the beginning of the distributions. There's a quantity of reserves, an aggregate quantity of reserves distributed in some way that we have from data. For that quantity of reserves, we let this micro model run, people trade with each other, banks trade with each other, set the interest rates, and then we average them out. We compute an effective Fed funds rate, a value-weighted average of all these rates. Notice there's a lot of heterogeneity in different types of banks trading with each other, different pre-trade balances, different times of day. So all that is averaged out, and we get a number. That number, for example, if we, if we feed uh, $1.2 trillion in the model, that number on the blue line, that's the effective reference rate implied by the model, which happens to be, knowing the theory as we do, it's a weighted average of all those marginal utilities across banks, across types, and so on. So this is literally a weighted average of those marginal utilities I showed you earlier. Okay, this, it looks kind of like a pool curve. This is calibrated for 2019, right before the uh, report disruptions. Um, so those were the ONRP, IOR, and the discount window rate at that, at that date. So let me, one benefit of having the uh, structural model, it's really tempting and useful to do counterfactuals. So I'm gonna do three. First one, suppose that I increase the frequency of payment shocks. Your clients are trading a lot and, they, and they're disrupting your, you know, your plan for end of day balances. What happens to the demand for reserves? It shifts up, it's a precautionary motive. You're, you're worried about these shocks that are so frequent, I wanna put you in the negative, you wanna hold more. So the marginal value of reserves just shifts up. That's kind of intuitive. By the way, I'm not gonna have time to do this, but this demand is a complicated object. When you think like this, you know, if there's aggregate movements in any of these variables, it's gonna oscillate around, it's gonna shift on a given day, so, you know, so it's, a, it's alive, <laughs> I don't know, yeah. Okay, the second thing we do, just to understand how it works, what I anticipated, we, we're gonna shut off from trading in a day the four fastest banks. So they're just not making markets. They say, you know what, we're worried. I see like uh, spikes in repo rates, I'm gonna stay out here, okay? This is what happens. It rotates, it becomes steeper. The intuition is what we had before. You're taking out of the averaging all the fast banks that have a flatter marginal value, you're left with the guys with the steeper ones, so now the aggregate demand reserves them. So, by the way, I'm not gonna have time to do this. In the paper we do counterfactuals that might look like the September 17 week of 2019, and we see to what extent a shock of this kind could rationalize with the quantity of reserves at the time, the spikes you saw in Fed funds rates which were smaller than the repo rates. But still a problem, because for the first time in 10 years, the Fed you know, violated their ceiling in the, in the 
uh, target band. The last example, and this is the more interesting for the quantitative stuff that we do later, is this exercise where it does is, so I tell you something. If I take the three administered rates, the ceiling, the floor, the basement, discount window rate, IOR, ONRP, and I shift them all, I add a constant to all of them, this demand is constant returns. Just everything shifts up. The shape doesn't change, it just moves up. But if you change the spread between the administered rates, then you're disturbing it. You're making it rotate, it shifts in a tail. What we're doing here is we're increasing the spread between the IOR and the ONRRP, which in our baseline calibration was 10 basis points. And then we say, let's add 10 basis points. This is what happens. On the long end, it shifts up. It rotates counterclockwise. This is going to be relevant because when you see all those papers that run regressions, because they have no theory, they don't know what to control for. They put deposits, they put this, they put that. And this is a key thing that here is telling you, you should be, sometimes, you know, when the, the regressor is the EA effective reference rate, net of IOR, that's not enough. You need to control for the two spreads, okay? So we're going to leverage that in what we do in a minute. So here's the data. Well, the data before I showed you was 2010 to 2019. We're kind of cautious and humble, so we're only going to go 2017 to 19, OK? Because all those structural, big structural policy changes, they're not in our theory. So we're not sure exactly. So we're just going to um, use data after all the big regulations, have been, all the ones I can name, have been phased in, LCR, SLR. OK. Now, this is that data. You see two axes here. On the top is the one that you get out of FRED. Those are total reserves. The bottom one are reserves that are in the hands of banks who trade in the Fed funds market at least once a year. So that's for our theory, the relevant one. But for the purpose of the talk, look at the top one. That's the one you can interpret. Okay? So that's the data. We've color coded it depending on, remember the three administered rates? The spread between the IOR and the ONRRP. So the spread between the floor and the basement changed quite a bit in that sample period, even that short period between 17 and 19. In case you're wondering, the big spread between the ceiling and the basement, discount window rate minus ONRP, that one was constant throughout. Okay? So now, our model, you saw, tells you that the demand should rotate when this changes. So here's what we're going to do. The first line I'm going to show you, well, I'll just do it. This is our baseline calibration. It's the one that I showed you earlier that was in blue, OK? Now, it looks pretty good there. That's virtue of the calibration. We calibrated our parameter, you know, two of our parameters, so that two of the many parameters we have, so that the, our demand generated by the theory goes through the red cloud. We calibrated to that sample only, and that it has the right local slope. That's why it looks like you know, it's as flat as the data. So if you run your standard, you know, money market uh, employee regression of like, you know, what happens to the slope when you change exogenous variation in Q. You run it in our model, you'll recover exactly what you would get if you run it on data from 2017 to, sorry, from, 20, from the period in 2017-19 when, when the administered rates spread was this, okay? Now, now I'm gonna show you other demands generated by the model where all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna freeze all the market structure parameters, market powers, frequency of trade, everything else is frozen. All I'm going to change are the policy rates, and we'll see what happens to the demand. We're going to change the policy rates so that they match the subsamples, yeah? So that's what it looked like. You ask me, it looks pretty good. So let's compare with others, okay? And we'll get to numbers in a minute. So you saw two papers, one in 2021, the one by my friend and co-author Gara, Afonso, Janone, La Spada, and John Williams, okay? That's a pretty, okay. This is, at some point in the paper, they say, let's try to get a global estimate, and they fit a, like a sinusoidal with uh, nonlinearly squares. We did the same thing, this is what we get. You know, it's not the fault of the functional form. You know, it has no information on that range. So it's just, it's fitting, it's using all the power of the slope to fit that flat bit. We tried variants of this, helping it out. A bit of theory. We know that you know, for low enough reserves, it should be getting closer to the discount window rate. So we put constraints on the estimation to help it do better. It doesn't. That is very finicky on, on what, you know, what you fit in as constraints. So that's the way ours look like. Where is that discipline coming from? 
from the market structure parameters that you need to match that network picture. So that's the discipline of our extrapolation. The other one, it depends on what functional form you put in and what you know, constraints you want to fit in. The other paper you saw, I think, last year, is some combination of Lopez Salido, Vicin Jorgensen, or maybe something on, by Vicin Jorgensen alone. They say, let's just run, you know, this is the usual, any staffer knows this regression, except they say, add deposits. And they have stories for why, and we can talk about that over dinner. I don't want to be on the record talking about this. No, I, I don't mind. But um, because I'm a full professor, you see. <laughs> so um, no, so basically, you know, it's a log linear. So first, of, first observation, if you go to low enough Q, it, be, it has an asymptote. So obviously we can, you know, we know it should level off at some point. It cannot go above the discount window rate. And then if you look on the long side, the slope is 1 over x. So it's kind of flat and flat, but it's never really flat. You never satiate the market. So if you, if you ask them what's the minimum ample quantity of reserves, they'll be in the order of 3 trillion. What's our prediction? That's, a comp that's beating uh, on them again. Our prediction will be this. So let me give you the last thing. We, have, we showed you a demand. There's a supply. The supply oscillates on its own, oftentimes. The TGA, the Treasury General Account, moves around. So we estimated from data, in a period when the Fed is being really passive in terms of open market operations, the daily distribution of reserve draining shocks. Okay? Any time that a private agent trades with Treasury, sends a, then that's a, a reserve draining shock, tax day, whatever. So that's, so that's going to give us, imagine the demand, and then we're going to make the supply oscillate according to these shocks. And that will give us a confidence interval on the model prediction of what the Fed funds rate will be on any given day. Example. Suppose that this is your target band, the dotted line. So you want to make sure your rate, your equilibrium rate stays building. Our point estimate, let's say that the reserves are, you know, up here, 1.3 trillion. So our point estimate is the interest rate should be this here, like around 2.4%. Okay? But there could be a reserve draining shot so big, a, a, like a 1% shock, that puts you up here. Okay? That we call MCV, hoping it will catch on with you guys, monetary confidence bands. Okay? So question that you, you could answer with this. Say, you know what? You want to make sure that you hit this target range with 99% probability on a, on a typical day. How many reserves do you need? You got to go to up here where this crosses, read up, 1.3 trillion. Now, if you're willing to tolerate a 95% probability of not leaving the band, then you can make do with about a trillion. Okay? So, conclude. What's the quantity of reserves that's ample enough? We did this by, with current data, by the way. It's still 1.3 trillion. We can talk about that. Because the, the demand has shifted, but the shape hasn't changed. So that's the number, 1.3 trillion. On any given day, you know, you can get rotations of the demand and so on. So, you know, you got to take this with a, not too much salt, but a bit. Um, and that's what the demand looks like. I'm done. Thank you very much, Ricardo, and we'll hand it over to Pierre. Hey, thank you very much. Can you, uh, can you hear me and can you see my, uh, my slides? Yes, uh, we can hear you and we can see you. Not yet the slides. Not the slides yet. It should show up, I hope, soon. I have shared the screen before, so anyways, I'm, I'm, I'm going to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. Uh, um, I also want to thank them for allowing me to discuss this, for making it possible for me to discuss it uh, online after I had to unfortunately cancel my trip at the, the last minute for health reasons. Um, I would much rather be with you guys, it would be a lot more fun. But, um, you know, let me just jump into this discussion. Hopefully you get, yeah, you see my slides now, great. So, you know, this is a really impressive paper. Uh, probably that's why I was chosen. Nobody, they thought they would, they could not find anybody crazy enough to discuss this paper. It's, it's more than 125 pages uh, with a very extensive appendix a uh, very technical appendix, and they do lots of things. They have a you know very high flying theory with a general equilibrium search model. They um, document lots of new and interesting facts about the microstructure of the interbank Fed fund market. Uh, they calibrate the model, they uh, simulate the model, they do some counterfactuals, they propose some policy tools, they do some policy experiments. So, needless to say, it's impossible for me in a ten minute discussion to you know give justice to everything they do. 
But I would recommend to all of you that are like me, uh, not experts in the microstructure of this of this uh, market, to actually read their paper. You'll you'll learn a lot. I certainly uh, learned a lot. What I what I will you know focus on is, and it's kind of nice to come after Daryl's discussion, because what I'm going to focus on is is uh, about the fact that we have here, I think, two very different views of what describes ample the ample amount of reserves needed. I think Daryl's speech, uh, an implied sort of model that he thinks about, I think is quite different from the one that Ricardo proposes. And I, I'm going to focus my discussion on, on relating the, 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 the two. I'm trying to switch my slides. So, you know, just introductory slide about what they, what they do to maybe uh, very quickly give you my sense of the, of the main contribution is, you know, as was extensively discussed during the whole day, we switched from you know pre uh, pre GFC pre crisis having you know intraday reserves less than 50 billion typically where where the Fed fund market uh, rate is uh, mandatory policy implementation is done through open market operations we're in the steep part of the curve on the left hand side to a you know post GFC post crisis uh, QE environment where the central bank had to buy lots of assets and therefore you know both the asset side increased but also the reserve side exploded and with you know reaching levels above two trillion that pushed us to this very flat side and you know now we're trying to get to normalization QT reduction and the question is and that's been sort of the topic for many things starting from you know Isabel Schnabel's this discussion in the morning to well how how much how much back to normal should we go? Should we go back to pre-crisis levels? And you know, the consensus seems to be that we should not, that we should stick to some ample level of reserves. But of course, the question is, what is that? Because we don't actually get to observe that inverse S shape. We don't know what it is. There's no way for us to observe it. And so this paper is going to be a lot about, well, how can we actually observe it? And their, their idea is, to, uh, is that this ample level of reserves should be uh, if we can estimate the slope of that curve is to stick to an area where the slope of the curve is not too steep. And so the question is then, how do we get an estimate of the slope of that curve? And, you know, there's a standard sort of reduced form econometric approach where essentially you use data. So you take daily data on the changes in the effective Fed fund spread or the effective Fed fund rate, but a lot of research is done in terms of the effective Fed fund spread over IOR. And you regress changes in that spread on changes in the total quantity of reserves, and you get some estimate, gamma, zero, gamma, which are parameters of that demand curve. But of course, you know, that, that approach has some issues. The issues are that, A, well, they're environment dependent. We use some amount of data during, during that data is valid for that period of time. It's also the specification. The specification is ad hoc. Here, we choose a linear specification. How good is going to be the linear specification? A specification if we extrapolate outside of the range of data that we have seen it's likely not to be very good economic theories predicts that it should not be linear we expect some asymptotes as ricardo pointed out so we have both you know an issue with the specification an issue with the parameters that makes it very difficult to estimate this uh, this this to extract from this estimation a valid demand curve that would be valid outside of the current uh, the current environment. So, for example, if we wanted to know what is the demand curve going to look like if quantity of reserves was a lot lower than what we observe in our data sets, or if we wanted to know what is the demand curve going to look like if we change the IOR to some level that we haven't observed, then this kind of approach is not very suitable. And so instead, right, this, this paper, which is its great, uh, nice contribution, is say we're going to use something structural. The benefit of a structural model is we have a lot of, you know, a lot of, uh, um, you know, we have we have a, a model that's constrained by theory and and some deep parameters. And, and so the idea is that if the deep parameters are not changing when the environment changes, then the predictions of the model will be useful even to learn some things about uh, events that may happen outside of the current environment. So what is this model? It's a in the tradition of, of uh, the search and matching model. So they have I wrote three, but actually I was reminded in Ricardo's talk that they actually have four groups of banks. So they have small, medium, and large banks, plus they have the GSEs. So they actually have four groups. In the model, these are continuums. So they are four continuum of small, medium, large, and GSC. These, uh, how it characterizes a large bank in their, in their model, it's characterized, but actually 
a frequency of trading. So large banks in their model trade more often than small banks. And it's all characterized by their bargaining powers. Large banks have higher bargaining power than small banks. In this model, these banks will be matched randomly and according to the, these parameters. And when they are matched, they bargain over the, the, the reserve balances. They are start with some exogenous endometer balance at the, beginning, at the beginning of the day, and then they are matched and they, they bargain on exchanging these reserve balances and on, they bargain on a repayment rate to uh, essentially get to the end of the day with balances that are positive because they dislike having negative balances. If they have negative balances, A is less than zero, then they need to pay the, the window rate. Actually, in their model, it's the window rate plus some exogenous penalty, which is it has to be estimated. And if they uh, have a positive amount of reserve, then it's they earn the interest on reserve plus some additional benefit that also has to be estimated. And so then, you know, you can think of this model as a very complicated model because, you know, you match these firms from the beginning of the day towards the end of the day, and the firms are actually optimizing. So they're looking ahead and solving a very complicated backward induction problem. Uh, you know, consider a small bank that starts out the, the day with negative position, knows that it wants to finish positively, gets matched with a large bank. It'll wonder, well, you know, even though the large bank has a higher bargaining power, I probably want to trade with that large bank, get some reserve to not finish with low reserve at the end of the day. But consider another small bank that starts with some relatively positive and dominant reserves may face some payment shocks in the future, but still may have an incentive not to not trade as much with the large bank it gets matched with because it hopes to have more time throughout the day to trade with a bank with a smaller bargaining power and therefore get better, better, better rates. So you can see how this is a very complex model because you have all these continuum of banks that have to optimize throughout the day. And so the beauty of that theory is they can get everything pretty much in plus form. They get the distribution of all those trades and rates in plus form. And these distributions follow deterministic equations throughout the day. Everything is pinned down by the initial distribution of these reserves and how they're allocated to the different banks. So once we know the initial distribution, the model delivers the explicit solution for the distribution of all the trades and the quantities and rates throughout the day. And that's actually what they use to construct their now endogenous structural demand curve. They basically shift the initial distribution of the quantity of reserves. Remember, the quantity of reserves stays constant throughout the day, just gets exchanged across banks. And as we shift this initial distribution, the model delivers an explicit solution for the you know, volume weighted average rate of all these trades between all these banks in their model. And that's how they create this endogenous demand curve. Now, the specification is not ad hoc. It's conditional on, these, on these, in this structural model. And the D parameters, all these parameters that govern, you know, probability of meeting somebody, uh, uh, bar bargaining power, the fudge rates, you know, ex you know, additional cost for accessing the discount window, the additional liquidity benefits for owning reserves, the payment shocks, all, those, all these are D parameters. So if these deep parameters can be expected to stay constant across periods, then we can use this structural model to indeed ask questions about how do we expect this interbank market to behave if we move, for example, the quantities of reserves outside of what we experienced in recent period. You know, exactly the question we want to ask, how far can we afford to lower the quantity of reserves without, you know, getting out of that ample reserve region, which we characterize by essentially a low slope in that, in that demand curve. So that's those very nice features of this model. And you can also ask questions uh, you know, about how does this demand curve shift if we change the IOR, the uh, overnight uh, reverse repo rate, uh, the discount window rates, and, and lots of other things. So it's a very nice you know, a feature of these structural models. Uh, to be, in principle, more robust to uh, out-of-sample uh, uh, predictions. Now, uh, you know, my job as a, as a discussant is, uh, you know, is to be, uh, is to try to make some comments, but I, I'm able, unable to switch my, my page. Um, doesn't move. Ah, here we go. So, uh, you know, the, the, the first question I want to ask is, ask about, well, the underlying assumption of this random search model, this high-flying theory that they propose, and compare them with you know, how, uh, what we see in the data. And, um, and also compare them with maybe underlying assumptions that I'm 
uh, assume is is uh, is the model that Daryl has in mind when he when he offers that when he offered us some some idea about what he thought drove the uh, the large moves in the uh, in the in the rates in the Fed funds market in the recent experience. So the first question is, you know, how, how deep are deep parameters? I mean, it, you know, in this model, the deep parameters are the probability of trading for a certain group of bank. You know the uh, bargaining power, the the uh, uh, frequency with which we might observe payment shocks, um, and and you you may wonder where th these problems may change, right? I mean, if if we move to an illiquidity crisis, if we if we move to a higher vol higher volatility environment, then we may think that some of these parameters, for example, the frequency with which banks will be willing to trade, that that is actually might be changing, and so and so of course you can do comparative statics on the model. Uh, i.e. change the intensity parameters and see how the model responds. But, you know, it's still probably likely to be very different if the banks inside the model expect that the probability that they meet somebody might change endogenously. They might actually respond to this. Um, so, you know, if, if, if such a move could happen, if such a large unexpected move could happen, intraday, then maybe they, this would have different implications about their demand for reserves. But, but more generally, I think, one issue is this random search model. Let me let me sort of go through a, a set of these assumptions that I think don't fit the the Fed funds market that well. So, for example, this assumption that we have a continuum of price taking banks, you know, for their calibration, for example, the group of large banks is four banks. Uh, in Daryl's uh, uh, discussion, he uh, he told us that the ten largest banks do more than ninety percent of the Fed funds lending. So they're of the, are responsible for 90% of the volume. So, and these 10 banks, they're not changing. It's not like, you know, they're changed every, every day, right? These are the same, same banks. So in this random matching theory, it's important that these banks, you know, they're never the same. They, you never meet the same banks twice. It's not a repeated game. And, uh, you know, and, and none of these banks really have, uh, have any large impact. They're all price takers. So, so you know, this doesn't sit, seem to fit very well. Uh, this this situation at least for large bank, and we can also think that this idea that you're never going to be rematched with a different bank is also unlikely to match the Fed fund market that well, right? These ten banks, if you're a small bank, you know to call J.P. Morgan, you know to call, you know, Bank of New York. So the, the it's unlikely that you have large search costs for the small banks to identify who they're going to trade with. So at least for trading with the large banks. It seems like this random matching assumptions don't fit the market very well. It, it would be probably more likely to sort of give special position to some set of, of these, you know, let's say four large banks in their model. And I think, you know, these guys, they're so talented with their modeling. I think they could do it. So they could probably have, you know, a sort of different way of dealing with, you know, maybe a continuum of small banks that may be a good idea, but having something, you know, having four large players or 10 large players might be something they could handle it. It might change. You know, certainly the network structure and might change some of the, the dynamics. In this model, there's no aggregate risk, right? So everything is deterministic. So there's no sense in which there are large shocks that may happen that would influence the outcome in this market. There's no counterparty risk. Everybody is a part of a continuum. There's no systemically important financial institution. So these are potentially big assumptions that don't line up perfectly with the and, and yet the model seems to be able to match things very well. So, so does it really matter? And he showed us how well the model matched, and it's true that it's impressive. It matched lots of things out of sample. So, so do these, you know, the fact that these assumptions don't line up so well with things that we can observe matter for the predictions of the model? I think, I think probably sometimes it does matter. So, and in particular, if we think about Daryl's uh, uh, presentation, he told us a lot about this one effect event, right, where you know, he had this picture. These two pictures actually are from his from his paper with Copeland and Yang, and so he already explained it better than I could. So that's nice. So I presume otherwise I would be running out of time. So, so you know, what he told us is you know, you might see changes in that blue line, which is the quantity of reserves, and sometimes you see a move and not a large in the blue line, and you don't see much happening to the red line, and sometimes you see a change in the blue line and you see a very large move in the red line. So the level of the quantity of reserves doesn't seem to be a sole explanatory, uh, you know, uh, variable for the crisis in the interbank market. He, he said, well, a, a better measure, something that seems to be predict, predictive of such a, an, you know, a crisis in the interbank market is the time delay by which the, the, the 10 largest banks 
receive payments from the smaller banks. And he explained nicely that this could be due to some strategic complementarity. The fact that, you know, if I know as a small bank that other people will not want to pay, then I am also inclined not to pay. And this is sort of really not consistent with, I think, with the assumptions of a, of a sort of continuum of banks that are all price takers and small. So, you know, it seems like to, uh, to, to essentially be able to capture some of these crises uh, that happen very rarely and, and, uh, in, and uh, have drastic impacts on, on prices, that uh, strategic notions, considerations are important. Uh, and so I think that's, that's I think, um, something to think about. And in fact, you know, Yang, one of the three co-authors, has a nice theory paper where he proposes a, a structural model, but very different, right, based on now a strategic complementarity. So it's important that banks are at least fairly large and act in a strategic way. And he also has a different way of calibrating this model and fitting it to the data. And his model is able to predict out of sample the uh, you know, episodic events of large spikes in this IOR. So it also has some nice features. And I'm thinking that you know, these two approaches could be complementary in thinking about uh, the level of reserves that are needed. Now, you know, being uh, you know, getting older by the day, um, the experience is that in financial markets, in all financial markets, we get to see you know, rarely, but actually maybe less rarely over time, some significant price moves that are very hard to explain ex ante and exposed, we often find, but sometimes not even exposed, but sometimes exposed, we can find some indicator like Daryl and co-authors did for this crisis. But it's not always the case that these indicators, they seem to work for the next crisis, right? We can think of the 1987 crash, we can think of the, of the flash crashes, Right, where we're still debating what was really the trigger. And we would be hard pressed to find you know, ex ante indicators for such crisis. So you know, financial markets seem to be you know, at times run by these sort of hoarding behaviors where, or hurting behaviors where, where we get some very strong price actions that are hard to predict. And so I think uh, you know, these two approaches are complementary, uh, but it seems to me that, and this has also been, you know, widely discussed by Daryl toward the end of this talk by Isabel in this, this morning. You know, it seems to me that we, we probably will not be able to find an ex ante level of reserves that will be able to be at the same time sufficiently low to avoid some of those costs that were discussed and avoid any crisis. So it seems to me that we need both ex ante and probably exposed tools such as, you know, standing repo facilities and, and making them, you know, less or uh, making market participants more inclined to use them seems you know uh, uh, crucial at the same time i also want to think that this discussion is also related to a paper that was presented this morning by you know lombardo aaron and jackson where you know there's also a macro side to this optimal size of the balance sheet which is probably important especially if we think uh, you know about these theories about portfolio balance and and how you know the level the, the exposure of the central bank to two bonds affects the level of risk so I think, you know, and, to, you know, and, and, and Ricardo and Paul, as they discuss it, and conclusion. So I think that's also a nice direction to, to take this uh, literature. I think I'm out of time, so I'll stop. Yeah. Thank you. Th thank you very much, Pierre. Thank you. <laughs> I'm failing on keeping my time here, but uh, Ricardo, do you want to start with this or just take a couple of questions? This is an important topic. Questions that maybe other people have, so I can yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay. So the first question was: Are these parameters uh, changing? Are they deep? Are they uh, parameters? So, I mean, obviously you have to start. Oh, we lost. We lost the visual on here. It's okay. <laughs> um, you have to start somewhere. So we we take them as parameters. So the first question is: Do they change over time? So those network pictures that I showed you very quickly. The, our identification for those parameters is hitting the network picture. When you look at the positions of the four banks, we did 2006, we did 14, we did 19, they're identical. So if, if we, so over that whole period, with all the changes that there were, the moments that those parameters are hitting haven't changed. So to our first approximation, it's not bad. Obviously, I like micro foundations as the next guy, so you can always go deeper, you know, and we know how to do that. You know, the contact probability, you can make it endogenous. If you're, very, if you're really out of line with your holding, you may want to search harder or something like that. So, so that we can do. Or you could make them, you know, exogenously moving over time. Those are things you could do. Our, 
for all your questions, our, our discipline has been, we're gonna put the minimal ingredients we need to hit all this rich data when it hit. And we'll stop there, because otherwise you never stop adding richness and so on. The second question, similar to that, is does it matter that you fit the network big time? Because that's our discipline. Remember, the contact rates, how quickly, those determine the shape of those curves that we're adding up. So, how, so the network is exactly the way to discipline them, because those parameters are determining the shape. Remember the fast bank and the slow bank? That's our discipline, it's hitting their trading frequencies in the, in the data. Um, so, so we think that's something that, you know, it's a key moment. It's not some random moment we picked out. It's the one that speaks exactly to that parameter. The second, this is a continuum of price-taking banks. There's a continuum of banks, they're never price-taking. They're always one-on-one -on -one bargaining. So it doesn't matter who you are, you're one-on-one, -on -one. it's a bilateral monopoly. So, that, so they're not price-taking. Um, it's not true also that the, because you're small that the core banks get the same rates as everybody else. I mean, we didn't show, part of our validation is showing that the, the core banks that trade a lot, they borrow cheap and lend expensive. If you look at the slow banks, they're always talking the wrong side of the, of the trade. It looks like they want to lose money in this market. They borrow expensive and they lend cheap. So that, the fact that the fast banks are better and more profitable, that's captured simply by the heterogeneity in the meeting uh, probabilities. Similarly, we match the network picture. So the stuff that uh, Daryl showed us for the repo market, here, the concentration in trading activity, we match it with the heterogeneity in contact probabilities. So we have these big systemic banks. When we do the network shock that we shut off the four banks, that's like saying, you know, a generous interpretation is we take in the four banks that we know what they are and take them out of the market. We do it with a continuum, but I don't think that's really first order. But you know, one, one could do this with discrete. The computational burden becomes really big now. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yeah. It becomes a model with aggregate uncertainty because if a big bank happens or not to have a trade, it affects everybody else. So that's, that's it. Uh, no aggregate risk, yes. That's, I mean, embedding this in a macro context, that would be really interesting, and we're, that's on our agenda of things to do. Um, and then just to conclude, I mean, so today I'm reminiscing with all this, uh, we talked about Prescott and the chicken models, and I talked about Wallace, and now Sargent says, it takes a model to beat a model. Okay, this model, I think, beats pool 68. It's in the same spirit, it generates the same demand with all this micro-richness. So I'm always happy to reconsider and get something that does better, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm editorializing on my own paper, but you'll be the judge. Thank you, yeah. Ricardo. I think we are running a little bit behind, but I can imagine maybe there are some eager questions <laughs> here in the audience. So over here, please, if I may remind to stand up as well. Many thanks, um, Barbara Mella from uh, ECB. Um, I would be interested, you said um, that the um, demand curve was different because of liquidity regulation, and I was wondering how this was captured in your, in your model, whether it was captured at all or just via the, via the data. Um, if it's only captured via the data, I would be interested whether you did um, look at the demand curve before liquidity regulation to see how the curve was twisted. And also maybe in the spirit of the leverage ratio, whether you would at some point see a different behavior once um, banks become constrained by the leverage ratio. Yeah. Okay. I think we had one more there as well. And then maybe. Yeah. Hi, I'm Janet. I'm from Bank of England. So we were lucky to have a session with Afonso and Lagarda. And Fed started to publish this elasticity to um, to forecast uh, uh, the reserve demand, the optimal reserve demand. So have you um, compared the res uh, result with them and then what is the difference and why do you think yours is, uh, your forecast uh, um, makes a stronger case? Thank you. Please. Yeah, um, so the answer to the SLR is we stayed clear of those regulations. We started, we, we only look at the data when we fit our demand after all these regulations have been phased in. Now, how would you introduce them in the model? One way you can introduce them is by putting, every time you get a loan, you have to pay interest. Imagine that, and this is gonna be crude, but imagine you, you have to pay back that plus a markup, which could take, in, could you know, stand in for the leverage cost of borrowing in the Fed funds market. You could do that. Uh, we haven't done it, so that, that you can do. Um, another way is, for example, Daryl, uh, so all these things, I don't think, they're kind of consistent in a way. Tell us concern about the intraday uncertainty about payment timing. 
we do an exercise like that because we, we read your paper. And so what we do is the way we do it is we make, in our baseline, I didn't say that intraday credit is, is free. There's no problem. So what we do is imagine that they perceive a cost you know, of tripping a regulation or something like that. And that has, it's a small cost takes big effects. It really shifts the demand up in precautionary sense quite a bit. The 2019 episodes, you know, they, they enter our confidence bands pretty neatly if you just put a little bit of a, this concern about uh, intraday uh, overdraft being costly, which I think captures your idea. So, you know, all these ideas you can, now, your question was about, uh, sorry. The, no, the, the second. Ah, the GARA, GARA, the new, okay. So that paper has two parts. The GARA, Janone, La Spada, and Williams. There's two parts. The first part is they, they give you a time series estimate of local estimates of the demand. They're very clear about that. They cannot recover the whole demand. And so we're not in conflict with that. In fact, we use their local estimates to fit our local demand. And we do something that they cannot do, which is fill in the rest of the curve. So their numbers, we trust them, I like them. And you know, we check them in summer and we use them as an input. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, Ricardo, you have more questions, I can see, but we will have to continue, so maybe you will be discussing later. Thank you so much. For that. And Ben, please. Good evening. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Uh, this is the last uh, presentation before dinner, so I will try to keep it concise and crisp. Uh, my name is Ben Harden. I, I'm an economist here at the European Central Bank, uh, and I'm looking forward to your questions on this uh, topic, which is quite dear to uh, what we are doing here in the, uh, regarding our operational framework. So first of all, the usual disclaimer applies, so these views here are expressed mine and don't necessarily coincide with the views of the European Central Bank or the Euro system. So let me start right ahead. This paper is essentially about an intersection of two different frameworks, two different, say, paths, uh, or two different aspects that banks are facing. One is the regulatory framework, and in particular, the liquidity regulations that banks are facing. And the other one is our monetary policy implementation frame framework, and in particular, the collateral framework that we have at the Euro system. So to be specific, let me start with the first one, so the regulatory framework, you all know that since 2015 and the introduction of the Basel III liquidity regulation, banks have to hold a certain amount of high quality liquid assets to essentially maintain their liquidity coverage ratio. And these, um, these assets essentially can consist of reserves um, or other very liquid assets such as government bonds, which are labeled L1. And you see here on the right hand side, the composition of these high quality liquid assets of uh, significant institutions in the Euro area. Um, and then there's also so-called L2 assets, which are less liquid and also less dominant, as you see here. So that's the first part of the puzzle. And you also see that within that composition, the share of reserves has actually increased quite a lot as we expanded our balance sheet, which is unsurprising because we put a lot of reserves into the market and they have to be held by banks. No? Now, the second part of the puzzle relates to our operational framework, and this is actually the, the whole gist of this paper namely how does this liquidity regulation interact with our collateral framework, with our operational framework. And maybe this is not uh, like well known to, to all of you, but essentially there's a peculiarity in the EU system on the EU area monetary policy framework, namely that we, when giving out credit, accept a relatively broad range of collateral, including HQLA assets, but also non-HQLA, such, such as credit claims or retained capital bonds, for example. And that essentially creates a possibility for banks to generate HQLA for their SCR purposes by pledging non-HQLA collateral with the EUR system and receiving reserves in return, which count as HQLA. And this liquidity transformation, and that's what I want to show you here, is actually quite substantial. So what you see here in the shaded area is essentially if I if I, if I mark all those reserves that are related to your system credit um, that is backed by non-HQLA, if I mark this here, you see that it's actually quite a substantial fraction of banks' HQLA buffer over time. And obviously it's diminishing now and being replaced by, especially by non-reserve L1 assets such as government securities. But in the past, it has actually played quite an important role for banks' HQLA buffer, especially during the pandemic and accounted for almost a third 
of uh, significant institutions age gradient buffer no? at p. So I think this is a some like quantitatively substantial uh, fraction, and therefore it's also. An, but I also want to convince you that it's important to understand economically what the implications of that are. And I think that these are twofold. So first of all, that has an implication for monetary policy implementation, simply because this. ACR benefit of borrowing reserves against non HQLA might create an incentive to borrow reserves in the first place. So there might be an ACR driven demand for reserves, which is important for understanding where the curve that we've just seen in the previous presentation actually lies. And the second aspect, of course, is relating to the financial stability and uh, the side effects that our, um, our operational framework might have. So this is where essentially the policy aspects come in. But um, as a preview, I will disappoint you on these policy dimensions and not go actually into that assessment uh, because this paper is not taking really a normative stance or following a normative rule. This paper is aiming to do something actually more, more fundamental, namely trying to assess the importance of this phenomenon um, quantitatively and also, so that's the first part essentially, I, in this paper I want to assess how large liquidity transformation through the collateral framework um, is. And in the second part, I want to disentangle the, whether this liquidity transformation happens coincidentally or whether it happens intentionally. And what I mean with that is that this liquidity transformation might happen coincidentally if simply it, it happens because the ACR applies less lenient haircuts than the EU system does. And then even if, the, if a bank pledges a representative sample of its eligible assets as collateral, then that might mechanically lead to this net generation of HQLA. But on top of that, it might also be the case that banks essentially pledge on, pur on purpose the least liquid assets first um, when moving collateral into the euro system. So it's basically a bias. It's not a representative sample of the eligible assets, but essentially they take the least liquid assets first. And this paper tries to get at that um, uh, via essentially two new approaches, and that's the main contribution which you see on the, on the right hand side, on the low, lower end, um, I present two new empirical approaches in essentially isolating and identifying this effect of intentional liquidity transformation um, and then assessing quantitatively how important that is um, within the liquidity transformation that's happening. So what I find just as a very f brief preview of the results is that, bank, that liquidity transformation is quite sizable, so in absolute terms, but also in relative terms, because they generate, on average, 92 cents of net HQLA for every euro that they borrowed from the euro system. So essentially, even if we take in, into account that some of the collateral that they pledge is HQLA, there's almost a one-for-one -one generation of net HQLA for every euro that banks borrow. So it seems sizable. I also find via both empirical approaches that banks actually pledge their least liquid assets first, and there seems to be a selective pledging behavior when it comes to the, to the collateral that they, they bring to the euro system. And then quantitatively, this intentional liquidity transformation accounts for 30 to 60% of overall liquidity transformation that banks are doing for LCR purposes. Um, of course, I'm not the first one looking in, into the LCR uh, impacts of, uh, of operational frameworks. And in particular, I want to highlight two, two papers um, that uh, do a very nice empirical identification exercise looking at the ACR introduction in 2015, which affected some countries that did not have a similar framework beforehand, but didn't affect others that had a similar um, framework beforehand. And, and one finds a, a significant impact on the reserve demand, like it done in Benghazi. And then there's also evidence that the collateral pledging behavior is actually different, differentially affected. But the main aspect that I'm adding here is this like SCR dimension in terms of, okay, what is now finally the ultimate amount of SCR space, if you want it, that banks create via this channel. Now, before I mo move into the empirical strategy, I want to first show you, give you some institutional background, and then also show you two empirical statistics, like descriptive statistics, that basically already, already highlight what's going on here. So regarding the institutional background, as I said, the SCR essentially requires banks to hold sufficient amounts of high quality liquid assets to cover the net, their net outflows in a 30 day stress scenario. These are basically grouped into three categories, but I'll be brief on that. The main point is that there's like very liquid assets in category L1, and as you've seen before, that's basically accounting for most of the, uh, of the HQLA of, of, of banks. 
And this is predominantly reserves, government bonds, but also high quality co cover bonds, for example. And then the second uh, relevant aspect is that the euro system accepts a broad range of collateral. And I would say uh, for good reason, because essentially it allows for a smooth implementation of monetary policy uh, in a, ge in a geographical area that we know can be quite heterogeneous across countries, across business models. And this broad collateral framework uh, essentially facilitates the transmission of monetary policy into that heterogeneous um, uh, banking system. We accept, oh, sorry, the user system accepts essentially HLA securities, that's unsurprising, but also, and that's important, non HLA, both in the form of marketable assets, so that's, for example, retained cover bonds or retained ABS, so essentially securities that banks issue themselves and then pledge with the US system as collateral. But the US system also accepts non marketable, non HLA collateral, such as credit claims, for example. And as you've seen in this very good uh, presentation early in the morning, um, that actually plays an important role uh, when it comes to, to banks' collateral mobilization behavior. Now, bringing to the two together, um, the SCR and Euro system actually apply different haircuts and eligibility criteria. Uh, I won't go into the details here, but the main point is that, by definition, <laughs> these non hqla assets are not accepted by the SCR for uh, SHQLA, as the name says. Uh, and the haircuts, of course, can differ for each asset class. No? Uh, and generally, the Euro system has a, like, a more lenient approach. Not for every asset, but for most asset classes. No? Um, so that creates, as I mentioned before, the possibility to actually generate net HQLA by pledging these non HQLA assets and then receiving reserves in return, which count as HQLA. Um, one last point on the institutional details, which might seem like a technicality, but actually you'll see that it's not so unimportant. Uh, at least in the Euro area, um, there's, a, there, there's um, a quite, quite interesting um, peculiarity when it comes to how the, the, the assets that are pledged with the Euro system are actually counted under the LCR. So you could imagine if a bank pledges more assets with the Euro system as collateral, then it's actually borrowing against. So there's some over collateralization that these assets are encumbered in a pro rata fashion. But that's not the case. Um, the, the SCI, at least in the European Union, applies a waterfall approach. So essentially, it counts the least liquid assets pledged as collateral first, up to the point where the credit outstanding is fully collateralized. And then everything that's left above that, so the, the collateral buffer that's remaining, counts as unencumbered. Naturally, that leads to, uh, to, to, to the result that the unencumbered stuff is much more liquid on average, than the overall collateral pool that banks have pledged with the Euro system, no? because you follow this waterfall approach. And as a mirror image, the encumbered uh, collateral is much more illiquid than, um, than what banks have pledged um, overall on average. So essentially, it's, you could also say it's a relatively benign approach towards banks, no? but it's important, as you'll see, for, for the quantitative estimates. It also means that, and sorry, that, that's a stylized picture. No? It's like not actual numbers, just to make sure. No? Um, it also means that for a given collateral pool, if credit outstanding increases, then also relatively more liquid assets will become encumbered on average. OK, but that is basically a side note that you should keep in mind for the results you'll see later on. Second, I want to show you, before I move to the actual empirical approach, I want to show you two descriptive charts. So the first one on the left hand side, to give you a broad picture of how collateral mobilization patterns look like, is essentially the composition of mobilized collateral over time, split into the different ACR categories I just showed you. And the black line shows credit outstanding. So what I want to show you is like two main takeaways are, first of all, there's quite a large amount of over collateralization. So everything above the blue line, essentially on aggregate, is basically unencumbered, um, or it's, it's, it's the collateral buffer. That's, of course, an aggregate picture. No? So essentially, it doesn't, you, you need to think of it at a bank level. Um, that, of course, there's also banks where L1 assets are encumbered. And the second interesting bit is that most of the assets that are being used are actually non hqla either in the form of marketable assets, so that's the green area, or in the form of non-marketable assets, so that's the light blue area. And um, yeah, if, you, if you calculate it, then you'll find that of all the mobilized, so all the pledged collateral, roughly 74% are non hqla and if you now follow this waterfall approach at the bank level, 
uh, which naturally basically gives an advantage to, to, uh, to banks in terms of their LCR ratios, you'll find that 92% of the encumbered assets are actually non HQA. So already from that, you see that this liquidity transformation channel quantitatively seems to be like non-negligible, let's say. Uh, and the second aspect I want to mention is that the elasticity also differs across these different types of assets. So on the right-hand side, you see basically local projections uh, estimates uh, of how the mobilization of HQLA versus non-HQLA um, evolves in the weeks after credit has been taken up. And you see that in response to an additional credit take up, HQLA actually jumps up quite a bit and then stabilizes, and non-HQLA doesn't, uh, doesn't react so elastically. So what it means is that if banks want to borrow more, they first bring, it, bring in more liquid assets, and then subsequently, as you see, they, they basically converge, subsequently replace these assets with less liquid ones. No? So on impact, it seems that the liquid assets are more elastic in reaction to changes in outstanding credit. Now, that was a, a lot of talk before, and now I want to just briefly move you through the actual empirical exercise I add in this paper. So the first part of the paper actually computes the amount of liquidity transformation that's happening, and um, what I do is, re it's relatively simple. No? Essentially, I map at the asset level the LCR haircuts and eligibility criteria and the ECP haircuts and eligibility criteria, and then I ask for every asset, what is the HQLA value from an LCR perspective of that asset, if I just use it for LCR purposes, and what is the value as your system collateral if I pledge it with the euro system and receive reserves in return, no? basically one unit of HQLA. And then I can compute the opportunity cost for every asset, okay, essentially how much net HQLA do I generate by pledging this, potentially giving up some, uh, some HQLA value because I can no longer use these assets directly for LCR purposes, but then receiving uh, reserves in return. No? So that's basically the opportunity cost calculation, which is behind this uh, ratio, and simply what you see is that um, so it's between zero and one. So if you have an asset that's non-HQLA, then the numerator on the right-hand side will be zero. So the liquidity transformation is one. So basically for every euro of collateral that you bring in or that you borrow, you get one unit of HQLA generated. Um, if the haircuts are exactly the same, so you pledge an HQLA assets where the LCR and your system haircuts overlap, then basically the liquidity transformation rate is obviously zero, right? So that's, that's how the range uh, evolves. Um, then the second step is to actually look into, well, do banks pledge least li less liquid assets um, first on purpose? So basically, do they do intentional liquidity transformation? And here I present two novel approaches. So the first one is based essentially on marginal changes in collateral and in changes of changes in the liquidity transformation rate. So the premise is, imagine that a bank um, pledges more liquid, more liquid assets only at the margin and pledges their least liquid assets first. What happens is that the moment a bank pledges one additional euro of collateral, then this additional unit of collateral will be more liquid uh, than the average pool it has already mobilized. So it will bring down the average liquidity transformation rate of its overall collateral pool, naturally. Right? So if they do this not intentionally, so, but essentially they just don't have a packing order when, when choosing collateral, then you would not see any relationship between the changes in collateral and the changes in the liquidity transformation rate, no? because essentially they draw a random sample from their eligible collateral. So the hypothesis I'm testing here is essentially if I regress changes in the liquidity transformation rate on changes in outstanding uh, and cha changes in collateral, is this coefficient negative? So essentially, do increases in collateral uh, lower the average liquidity transformation rate of a bank? So that's the first approach. The big advantage of that approach is that it actually covers all the assets that banks bring to us, no? because it essentially com can compute that for non-HQLA, for HQLA assets, for every asset. So it's quite comprehensive. The disadvantage here is that you cannot really quantitatively, you, ca you can show that there is intentional liquidity transformation, but you cannot quantitatively pin down how much of the liquidity transformation is coincidental and how much is intentional, because for that, you would need to compare what they bring to us with the overall pool of eligible assets they have. And that's data we don't have, at least not at the necessarily granular level. So that's why I have the second approach, which actually allows to do that, and it's based on the pledge securities. 
um, that, that banks have with us versus the amount of total eligible assets that they hold on the balance sheet. And the big advantage is that you can then actually compare, okay, do they pledge a representative sample of their eligible asset holdings or do they pledge less liquid assets compared to what they have on the balance sheet? Yeah, so it's a quite straightforward exercise and then you can actually quantify, okay, you can run a, do a counterfactual, okay, how would the liquidity transformation rate look like if they would pledge a representative sample? And how does it look like in practice? And then essentially the difference between the two will be the intentional liquidity transformation. Um, and that allows you to quantitatively disentangle that. The disadvantage obviously here is that this exercise can only cover marketable securities that banks have. So it will not cover the non-marketables that they have. Now, I'll be very briefly on the data I use. Essentially, I use um, granular asset level data at the, uh, at the bank level that are mobilized with the Euro system. I use asset level information that help to determine their SCR eligibility and haircuts. Um, uh, I also use the Euro system haircuts, obviously, at the asset level. And then I have a mapping um, that allows to identify retained and uh, non retained cover bonds in ABS, which is important for their age A classification. Um, and that data is essentially also used, obviously, for the first uh, approach here on the marginal effect. For the pledge securities, I'm using uh, the security holding statistics by banking group, uh, which is a quite granular data set for significant institutions where you have information on, at the ISIN level of how much um, of a given ISIN banks are holding. And obviously, I, that can be merged with the collateral pool of the respective banking group. And um, this data is, is quarterly, so it's a bit of a different frequency. Okay, then let me move forward to the results, and I want to present you essentially four sets of results in line with the, 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 the purpose of the paper I've, I've just shown you. So first, let's just look at the liquidity transformation rate and how it looks like. Yeah? You see here on the right-hand side the liquidity transformation rate for mobilized, so for pledged collateral overall, and you see it only for um, encumbered collateral, which is the yellow line. And in gray in the back, you see the absolute amount of net HQLA generated um, via this liquidity transformation channel. Okay. So let me highlight a couple of takeaways um, um, th that I think are important for understanding the results. So first of all, and that's unsurprising, um, the liquidity transformation rate is higher for encumbered than for mobilized collateral because uh, the ACR regulation follows this waterfall approach that basically counts non hql as assets as encumbered first. So that's why the yellow line is above the blue line. The second observation, and I think that's quite interesting, um, is that the, uh, the liquidity transformation rate drops after large credit allotments. So if, for example, you look at, um, you know, okay, I mean, you'll see it. No? If, for example, you say uh, in 2017, we had a large, relatively large credit allotment, and you see that the liquidity transformation rate dropped on the impact. A similar pattern can be observed in the early stage of the pandem pandemic when the bridge LTROs were allotted. And then a reverse um, pattern can be seen when we had the big early repayments in 2022 uh, of Teltros. You see that the blue line actually goes up. Uh, and the reason what's behind here is that related to the elasticity I've shown you earlier, that basically banks pledge their most liquid assets on impact and then subsequently like, move in more and more uh, less liquid assets. And similarly, if there's a big repayment to take out the most liquid assets, uh, so government securities, for example, out first um, because they have the highest opportunity cost. <clears throat> and then the third aspect I, I would like to highlight is this interesting difference in the, timing, uh, in, the, in the time series pattern of both rates. You see that the, uh, that the liquidity transformation for encumbered collateral, which is relevant for the actual liquidity transformation that's happening, co-moves quite a lot with the uh, with the credit outstanding during the pandemic. And, and the reason is somewhat mechanical uh, exactly because, well, th the reason is semi-mechanical. Huh? The, the one reason is that there's this waterfall approach that essentially you, for a given set of collateral, you at the margin encumber more liquid assets than what is already counted as encumbered. And the second aspect is that collateral pools are quite sticky. So they don't increase one for one. Uh, so essentially when you have a credit expansion, then on average, as you see, the, uh, the encumbered assets will be relatively more liquid because the share of encumbered assets in that pool increases, no? and that's predominantly more liquid assets that count as encumbered. So that explains why the patterns change, uh, differ here between the two lines. 
Now, the second set of results relates to the marginal impact of changes uh, in the collateral, so the first empirical approach to identify intentional liquidity transformation. And you see the regression results here in the left-hand panel. Um, so you see throughout negative coefficients controlling for bank and time fixed effects and also for changes in credit outstanding. And the coefficient here is 0 .0, minus 0 0.05. So essentially for a 1 percentage point increase, um, in, sorry, for a 1 percent increase in mobilized collateral, the liquidity transformation rate drops by 0 0.05 percentage points. So it might seem quantitatively small, it's true, uh, but it's a relatively robust estimate um, uh, across all jurisdictions, uh, jurisdictions, actually, as you see. Um, the second main takeaway actually relates to jurisdictions, which is an interesting pattern, I think, is first of all, this coefficient varies quite a lot. So it seems to be there for most jurisdictions, but it varies quite a lot. And it doesn't really seem to be related to the average amount of liquidity transformation happening. So essentially, this coefficient, which is kind of a proxy for how much intentional liquidity transformation are banks doing, is not necessarily related to how much liquidity transformation are they doing on average, which is more reflective of okay, the financial structure, the availability of certain non-HQLA financial instruments, of credit claims, maybe also the existence of ACC frameworks and so on. Yeah. All right, so this is the, the results of the first set. You see there's a clear pattern that essentially liquidity transformation rate drops when the banks move in additional collateral, so there seems to be evidence that essentially there's, uh, that, that essentially there's a certain packing order when they choose the collateral to be mobilized with the euro system. The second set of results relates to the security holdings and the set of securities that banks bring to us uh, versus what they have on the balance sheet. And here you see actually quite a striking difference. So if you look at um, the composition of collateral by a CR category of uh, um, applying ECB haircuts, you see that the overall security holdings, so this is the second bar from the left, um, contains some non-HQLA, so for example, retained covered bonds that they hold, but it's much less than what they bring to us. So it seems to be non, not very representative. And more interestingly, if you look at the bank quarter level, so you make a scatter plot from that and compare the amount of liquidity transformation that's happening um, in, in the overall pool of eligible assets banks are, are holding versus the amount of liquidity transformation that they have mobilized with us, you actually see a striking difference. No? So on average, most DOS lie above the 45 degree line, and it seems to be quite, like, quite, quite widespread phenomenon and pattern. So the main takeaway here is that the, there's a significant difference between the liquidity transformation rate of banks' overall eligible asset portfolios, so that's roughly 29%, and that is basically what I would label the coincidental liquidity transformation rate. So essentially, if banks would just pledge a representative sample of their marketable securities, then this is roughly what you would get in terms of liquidity transformation. And if you now instead look at the collateral pool that they've actually mobilized with the euro system in terms of marketable assets, then it's much higher, so it's 45% roughly. All right, so let me move based on that to the fourth and last part of the results which is essentially taking these estimates and extrapolating, or like basically calculating a bit of back of the envelope, um, how much intentional and how much coincidental liquidity transformation is happening over time. And you see that split here uh, on the right hand side. Um, the yellow part is the intentional part, so which I identified from the, from, from, from the, the previous results or from the securities holdings. Uh, and I basically assume that for non-marketables, the split between intentional and coincidental uh, is similar. And you see that the, the share of intentional liquidity transformation has been 60% um, before the pandemic and then dropped quite a bit during the pandemic and then went up again. The second interesting finding, I think, is that the coincidental liquidity transformation increases a lot when, when credit outstanding increases. So for example, during the pandemic, and it is essentially the same somewhat mechanical feature that Collateral pools are relatively sticky, so if banks take up more credit as they did during the pandemic, they have to encumber more and more liquid assets. So this coincidental liquidity transformation then increases naturally. Yeah? Whereas the intentional part seems to be relatively stable. Yeah. Okay, and with that, I actually almost have two minutes left for a conclusion, so let me just um, wrap up. So this paper is essentially um, a quantification exercise on a, on a phenomenon that has been widely discussed, namely 
to which extent do banks use the collateral framework of the euro, of the euro system to generate HGLA for, for LCR purposes? And it's not giving a definitive answer whether, um, uh, whether this is a good or bad thing. I really I want to steer away from that, but I think it's a, uh, it's a foundation for actually being able to assess the extent to which, to which this is happening and also to see at the bank level how this changes and uh, what it depends on. And what I find, as is, you've seen, is that it's actually quite a substantial phenomenon if you look at framework, and that, uh, that there, there is clear evidence that banks are doing this, or you essentially are aware of that and, and, use, and doing this liquidity transformation on purpose in the sense that they have a clear packing order when they choose collateral with the euro system. And with that, I want to close. Thanks a lot for, uh, for, for your attention. I'm looking forward to your questions and especially discussion by Quentin. Thank you very much. Okay, so thanks a lot for giving me the opportunity to discuss this very interesting paper. Um, so it's a short discussion, so I'm going to jump right, right into it. So um, I'll do half a slide summary of the paper first. So the main finding of the paper is really that ECB credit operations are actually net producer of HQLA. And then the paper goes a little bit further than that and tells exactly why. And I think I can summarize that with three different margins. The first margin is that on average, on bank balance sheet, ECB haircuts are actually lower than HQLA haircuts. So mechanically, if they pledge that as collateral, they are going to generate HQLA. And then beyond that, within the set of uh, assets that are deposited as collateral, there's this waterfall lexicographic priority that's given to the less liquid assets. So for that reason, it's going to add up some additional margin for, for which there's going to be additional HQLA that's created. And then lastly, and that's, that's why um, the, the banking individual data is very useful, we also find that banks actually tend to actively post uh, assets that are less liquid than what they have on their portfolio, so they choose to actually create this liquid, this uh, HQLA assets. Um, and then the paper is really about is like comp computing a number for this liquidity transformation rate, and what Ben com comes up with is a number of uh, 92%. Okay, so uh, it's late uh, in the afternoon, so I thought it would be useful to do kind of like a graphical representation of these things because it's a bit complicated. So I'm starting with a balance sheet of a bank that's kind of stylized. On the uh, liability side, you have deposits of two types. One is unstable, the other one is stable. It's going to be useful for the cap calculation of LCR. On the asset side, you have loans, you have ABS, you have sovereign bond, and you have reserves. These assets, they have different weight when it comes to HQLA. First of all, the, all the loans are not considered H HQLA at all, so they get a zero weight. And then you have the ABS. The ABS, the counts are a little bit liquid, but not too liquid, so they get 50% weight. So you only count half of them. And then the reserves and the sovereign bond, they both count as 100%. And then what LCR is effectively doing is taking the ratio of the HQLA asset weighted by the weight divided by the unstable deposit that may flow in the 30 days. And so in this particular picture, we see that the ratio is actually positive. You have something like 150% because you have more book of the green than, than, the, than the red. Uh, and what the paper is, ab is about is how much HQLA are going to, co to create when you uh, do some credit operation. You pledge some of your assets as collateral and you get more reserves. So let's see what happens whenever you pledge sovereign bonds as, as collateral. Well, in this case, you're going to transform one asset that has 100% HQLA weight to another asset that has 100% HQLA asset. So your liquidation, uh, liquid transformation rate is going to be close to actually 0% in this case. Uh, LCR doesn't move. So what you can also do, you can use the ABS. When you use the ABS, you're going to, use, you're going to, to get something that's worth 100%, and you're going to, uh, to re replace it by, uh, from something that used to do 50%. So in this case, the liquid transformation rate is going to be 50%. So you, you increase LCR in, the, in this case. Well, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that because the ECB asks you to put some margin, and so you need to take that into account as well because the margins are actually effectively in reserves that then gets encumbered, and then you cannot use it as, as HQLA. So this number then becomes a little bit smaller when you do the actual formula. And then the last thing, which is kind of best case scenario, best thing you can do, you can actually use directly the loans that have zero HQLA weights, but that actually counts as... as um, but and then in order to get reserves, and then in that case you're going to get a liquid transformation rate that is 100%. Something I want to note here is that this is really the liquidity transformation rate for reserves, and not the liquidity transformation rate for collateral. So it's a, it's in unit of reserves that you get, not in unit in, of, re, of collateral that you pledge, because otherwise you would need to also subscribe the ECB haircut from this particular case. This is going to come up later in the discussion. 
Okay, so overall, I find the paper very convincing, actually. There's like not much I can really argue about. I think everything is done very convincing way. If anything, it's the paper has maybe a little bit of an ex post obvious uh, kind of problem because it seems it's like so reasonable that this result is there that, that, that you really believe it. But I also think it's a little bit unfair because I actually hadn't thought about it before. And it's actually also an important point because mostly for two reasons. So qualitatively, this, this is a very important distinction between the passive credit operation that are actually going to create some HQLA assets and the uh, active purchase operation that, that, that the ECB might be doing, which has this zero uh, LTR in this case. And also it means that the ECB, uh, the ECB has effectively an automatic elasticity or automatic stabilizer that's going to prevent like, a, a scarcity of HQLA to just shoot up at some point in time, so it's good to know. And quantitatively, it's also probably a number that men would want to know exactly what on the margin uh, is going to be the, 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 uh, this, this LTR. If anything, my, my main suggestion would be that you can actually go beyond that number and try to compute the whole curve, because we know that as uh, the credit operations are going to increase in size, they're going to use collateral that is more and more liquid, so this LTR is going to fall, and I guess that's something you can compute, might be interesting as well. Okay, so I'm really going to have only two comments. The first one's going to be, and both of them are going to be about policy implications, mostly. The first one's going to be about the demand for reserve. The second one is going to be about the demand for HQLA uh, directly. So about the demand for reserve, it didn't really show up in the, in the presentation, in the paper. The paper has like an extensive policy implication uh, section. So I'm just going to read what, what, what they have in the paper. The paper effectively argues that the tightening of the margin requirement should have an ambiguous uh, impact on the reserves for demand. It says the overall uh, decrease in the supply of HQLA would make LCR induced liquidity constraint more binding and thereby increase the overall demand for uh, generating additional HQLA on the one side, but also on the other side, a negative substitution effect would reduce the demand for Euro system credit as bank needs to pledge more HQLA to obtain one Euro of Euro system credit. So it's theory could be ambiguous and might depend, so which of it dominates is going to depend on substitution availability and the pricing. So I do what I like to do. I just decided to write a couple of equations down, I thought maybe a good model of what banks want to do is try to minimize the cost of regulation. So here what I have, they minimize the cost, C, um, um, of the credit operation uh, C, and then the, the cost of actually acquiring this credit operation. So you can think about LC as being the interest rate of the, on this operation and R as being the risk free rate or something like that in the economy. And there's also some alternative asset that is also liquid, which, which is B, and the cost of holding this liquid asset, maybe convenience or something like that. So in this particular example, I'm actually assuming that uh, the, H, the, um, the constraint is going to be that you, you have to use this uh, credit operation uh, in order to acquire enough reserves to meet a certain threshold H. And there's going to be um, um, a discount here that comes from the, al the alpha, which is this margin. So effectively, one minus alpha is this LTR, this collateral LTR that I just mentioned before. So in this particular case, the solution is actually very simple. If the cost is actually positive, then what you want to do is just like pick up the quantity of reserves, the minimum uh, quantity of reserves through credit operation that ex exactly matches the constraint. You don't want to over overdo it. And so in that case, if you increase uh, the, the margins, you're going to reduce the effectiveness of the reserves in meeting your constraints. So the collateral LTR goes down. So it means that actually, because you, you can only use reserves in this case, uh, you're going to have to increase your demand for reserves. Okay, but that's not exactly the way um, LCR works. In LCR, you also have a, sub a substitute asset. You can not only use reserves that you get from, from this credit operation, but you can also use some treasuries that you buy from the market. So in this case, you have basically this aggregate, linear aggregator on the, on the constraint side. So how is that going to change the, the picture? Well, in this case, before uh, choosing how much of the asset I'm, I, want, I want to buy, I need to do like a comparative cost estimate of how am I, am I going to meet the, the constraints. So am I going to use uh, TBLs or bonds, or am I going to use the credit operations? And so for that, that's going to depend on, on the, again, on this LTR that's going to make the reserves less effective uh, as a way to, getting, uh, to meeting the constraints. So you need to, to control this effective cost per unit of HQLA target H uh, by dividing uh, the cost by the LTR by per, to get the per unit of efficiency. So what is the solution? Also very simple. Um, as long as it is cheaper to go and get the credit operation than buying the treasury bonds, well, you're going to get everything from the credit operation, uh, exactly the same as, we had be, as what we had before. Um, but at some point, you're going to reach a threshold where it's actually better to just buy the treasuries in the market, and then you're not going to get any credit operations, uh, and you get everything from there. Okay, so how does that affect um, when there's a tightening in, the, um, in, in this uh, margin? Well, 
as long as you are locally, as long as this, as long as this condition is met, and it's actually cheaper to do the credit operation, things are going to be exactly the same. So you're going to increase the, the tight, tighten the constraint. This is going to make the reserve less efficient. You need more reserves. But at some point, uh, doing this, you keep increasing the margins. You're going to move, maybe move the threshold, and you're going to reach the point at which um, you are actually will want to start buying the treasuries rather than the reserves uh, from the credit operation. And so at that point in time, the, the demand for reserves is actually going to go to zero in this case because it's a linear aggregator. So we have exactly um, what, what Ben uh, speculated. You have like this ambiguous effect between the two, depending on the threshold. So it would be useful to just discuss that. Okay, I just have one additional point. Uh, so the paper argues that the results are evidence that banks want to economize on HQLA. So I, I, I don't think the paper really has, um, or can really reach this conclusion, basically mainly for two reasons. The first one is that the credit operation that are studied were actually heavily subsidized. They were like the, doing, doing TLT, TRO, so there's the T in TLO, in TLO, in TLT, TLO. Effectively, um, it was in my model before, it was manipulating the RC and putting it below the R. And so if you do this, then it's just like a very different environment. And then the second reason I'm going to conclude is that HQLA can actually be more valuable for other reasons than just being HQLA. For instance, we know that all of the sovereign bonds, they were trading special at the time. So in a way, it would be very silly to pledge some uh, treasuries, um, some, some sovereign bonds around the time because you would basically be bailing on a free option to, to, to pledge them in the, in the repo market when they would be trading special. So it's a bit of a question about external validity, how things would be whenever you move to this world where HQLA is actually, is actually uh, binding. So great paper, just two suggestions. And maybe you can compute the marginal optimal LTR, LTR curve uh, and maybe be a little bit more from that economy is collateral does, does not necessarily mean economizing on HQLA. Thank you. Thank you. Ben, do you want to respond first um, or do you want to take a couple of questions? May, maybe I can quickly respond because yeah. I think there were, so first of all, Great discussion, and uh, so first of all, I, I think I will steal a visualization because it was better than everything I had shown uh, and more intuitive. Uh, but it's actually quite quite good to illustrate how the whole um, mechanism works. Um, on the, the one point actually that you mentioned on the liquidity transformation rate for asset purchases, so I didn't mention it. It's a bit more intricate than that because it's true that roughly you exchange one le one type of HQLA for another. But that's only essentially the numerator of the ACR. Uh, depending on how the, the asset purchases are done, so whether you buy directly from banks or from non-banks, you might also have changes to the denominator because you have more flighty deposits. No? But, uh, okay. um, the second point, I think the model is great, actually, because I had written down this in a more qualitative way, but actually I had never sitting down like done essentially the, 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 the simple model you've now shown, and I think it's quite intuitive highlighting this ambiguity. Um, I think one aspect that I would add is that these alternative B assets, in terms of other HQLA that you, you can you need. Um, so if it's about HQLA, essentially, you 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 need to um, you need to generate HQLA, for example, by borrowing in the term market or uh, against non-HQLA collateral, in the term market especially, um, to actually generate HQLA. Because, for example, if you if you borrow in the short-term repo market, then it's also just wash now in terms of ACR. Um, and, and for that, then the opportunity cost of, okay, how costly is that also matters, so that the, the rate on that. And, um, but I think we can actually look into that. And there's an interesting paper by, by a colleague, Yannick Schneider, who actually quantified how much banks are paying in private repo transactions to create one unit of HQLA. Um, and then maybe one last point on this. Uh, so it's on the last slide you had, true, the t so. The Teltra episode and so on, I mean, these operations were relatively favorable. I, I wouldn't say that the T stands for subsidized, but anyway, you're, you're right. No, it's like it was very favorable and unlikely banks being flushed with ACR at that stage didn't participate in the Teltras for ACR purposes, but it's more a side effect. Absolutely, well, point is well taken. No? Um, and that's why I also am trying to stay away a bit from arguing that. Um, that based, this is a causal channel here, that this is really like SDR driven credit demand. It's more about, okay, what type of, of, um, of assets do they bring? And then brings me to the second point that you raised, you're absolutely right. It's not only the SDR that affects banks' collateral choice, no? it's also the overall opportunity cost of different asset classes. And, and, and arguably, non marketable assets have like zero opportunity cost or like relatively low opportunity cost and, uh, for other reasons, whereas especially special government bonds are um, way more costly. No? 
Okay, um, thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Ben. Um, I know we're over time, but maybe just one, or I see a hand over here. Uh, and just if you can stand up, please. Yeah. When Jean-David Sigo, ECB. Um, would there be a case for the ECB to, um, to open an asset swap uh, a program where um, you know, the banks would uh, bring, let's say, an ABS and, uh, and get home uh, you know, a government bonds uh, without going through the reserves? And that would be neutral in terms of uh, reserves in the system. Uh, thank you. Do we have any more? Questions or ah, over there? First of all, I really enjoyed this paper. I think it um, it brings to light something people have talked about for a long time, which is the liquidity upgrade of a system that has a broad collateral basket. Um, my question was really about the how much they're doing this to gain HQLA, and I wondered if you had looked at the HQLA, um, the LCR position of the banks that you were studying. So for example, were banks that were well over their LCR still doing the upgrade? And if you had thought of, of looking into that to see if it was the alternative use of the asset or the, or the LCR that they were doing it for. So I think maybe okay. we have to. Yes, good. Okay, thanks a lot for the two very good questions. Let me start with the second one, which is a bit easier to answer. Um, so no, I, I haven't done that. So it's, um, I haven't looked at essentially the results by SER quintile or so. It's also a tricky thing to do because, um, I mean, we are in a period or have been in a period for a while where banks were flush with SER and then essentially the, the, I mean, it's hard to say what a high or low SER is because the counterfactual is somewhat a non-observed um, a target ACR that we don't necessarily observe, no? Um, but as, as soon as the IC, or if ACRs in the, indeed decline or become more binding constrained, I think um, there, there would be quite a heterogeneous pattern in whether banks, banks use it and to which extent they use that. I mean, one point is you'll see, it, I mean, okay. I mean, you, you see that also after we in, introduced the changes to the operation framework and, and made essentially also the standard financing operations like much more, like say more attractive than before, there, there hasn't been a, like very sizable uptake. No? So it doesn't seem at least on in, in, in MRO and LTO participation, so at least on aggregate, it doesn't seem that there's a, a massive um, increase related to that. Now, second question on this asset swap um, facility. I, so I see the point um, that essentially this, such a facility would somewhat isolate reserve demand from SER driven motives to go to, to the refinancing operation. I, I haven't thought about it. I could see a couple of um, issues with that, um, but okay. Sorry, I, I need I need to think about it a bit more, not to give you a, a proper answer, uh, because it's uh, I think the trade-off is a bit complicated. So no, I I, I don't want to shoot ahead with yeah. you. No, <laughs> no, exactly. I'm not a full professor, half <laughs> half, half economist. So um, yeah, I, I but I think about it. Thanks for the suggestion. Yeah. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, the authors, for the excellent papers and the two discussions.